Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin. Uh, it's the end of January, uh, and uh, it may be in the 60s in the next day or two. This is climate change, and it's environmental, and in, there's a great segue. We are. Uh, I'm doing what I think is one of the most important uh, interviews I've ever done with Sean Stratton and Sherelle Snyder. Uh, we're going to be talking about lead uh, in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, in pollution and the effects of lead on, on people. Uh, and, and, uh, Sean and I met in one of my favorite hangouts, that's called LinkedIn. Uh, and we met, uh, I think three years ago, Sean, uh, when you were doing some work with water in Newark, uh, and I'm a Newark guy, um, went to Week High School in Newark. Uh, and, uh, actually I write about Newark. I don't mind doing a plug. I write about Newark, I write about Rutgers, and my second novel is A Tortoise in My Hair, A Journey to Spirit. It is a bit of a love story to Rutgers, and, and Sean is going for his PhD uh, in public health uh, at Rutgers, uh, and Sherelle uh, is from Urban Promise Trenton, and you guys are going to talk all about that. Uh, this is so important, what we're going to be talking about now it's life uh and, and it's quality of life it's a whole bunch of different things it's right here in new jersey it's lead it's a problem that's clear across the country uh and 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 the work you're doing is nothing short of amazing uh and so needed so um i'm actually honored that both of you are here and we're going to talk about this stuff and and i've been perusing this uh uh, PowerPoint that you sent me and, and reading and trying to understand. We'll get to some of these things later, but we've got a bunch of things to talk about. So I'm done with my uh, old-fashioned Johnny Carson monologue. If You probably don't know who it is, Sean. Sherelle, you might know, but um, I'm dating myself, so be it. Uh, anyway, uh, Sean, Sherelle, uh, take it away, do a little background, talk about the work you're doing, and, and then we're going to uh, ask some questions. Sean. Sure. Uh, so my name is Sean Stratton. I'm a PhD student or candidate here at Rutgers University School of Public Health. Um, I'm doing my dissertation work all around lead, lead exposure and reducing lead exposure um, down in Trenton, New Jersey. And I would like to emphasize that none of the work that I could be doing could be possible or is possible without my partner, Sherelle Snyder, who's um, instrumental in this work as for, coming from the community. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Sean Rutgers, what, what can I say? I'm just so happy to be partnering with you guys. So hello, I'm Sherelle Snyder. I am a community organizer for the East Trenton Collaborative, um, employee of Urban Promise Trenton as well. So the East Trenton Collaborative, collaborative um, it operates in the East Trenton um, Center in the North Ward over at 601 North Clinton Avenue. And in organizing our center, we organize around economic development, physical development, and social development. Social development, because of that, um, we focus on community events, services at the center, organizing directly with the community on issues that affect them. And because of that, we are one of four lead-free New Jersey hubs in the state of New Jersey working around lead toxins. And because of that work, we've getting to work with um, Sean and Rutgers, and I'm so proud. Thank you for having me, Calvin. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to get involved like this. And you too, Sean. Uh, that's just what I needed, you know, to 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 feel uh, involved in, in something that's so important like this. As I mentioned, I, I've I've been in, quote concerned about the environment since April twenty second, nineteen seventy. Wow. Uh, yeah, when we had the first Earth Day, and, and and it was like somebody hit me over the head. Wow, do we, we have issues. And it's funny, I was looking over some of the materials from that first Earth Day. Uh, April 22nd, 1970, things that we're concerned about, things that we should be doing. Uh, and I said to myself, Eureka, that's an old fashioned alert term. Eureka, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. 
nothing has changed. Anyway, well, I got let out uh, of gasoline in 1978. Hooray. Uh, so uh, let's jump in to some work. Um, I'll just throw this out. Uh, wh what are some of the issues uh, you're facing in the East Trenton neighborhood? Mm. Calvin, you said you got involved in the 70s. Yeah. And just like you, it was Eureka. I couldn't believe that this is happening. And once you know better, you have to do better. And that's what's happening. Like they say, ignorance is bliss. Because now that I know, oh my goodness, you have to work at trying to make things better. And being an organizer, it gets to start in the East Trenton neighborhood. But as a Let Free New Jersey hub, we're going to expand this over Trenton. And we work with other states as well. Trenton, poverty, poor housing, um, poor water infrastructure. Our children are going through so much. Environmental justice community, all the burdens, not enough of the benefits. The lead is in the old pipes our homes, pre-1978 homes with chipping, peeling paint. And because they had to bring in dirt, soil from other places to build the housing in the East Trenton neighborhood, the, the dirt that they brought in was um, pottery filled with um, pottery. And these pottery pieces you can find now and they're big pieces. And we all know that pottery, the glazing has, was made with lead. So this is in the soil. EPA says the lead level shouldn't be no more than 400 parts per million, which has since January 17th decreased to 200 parts per million. Maybe Sean can talk about that more. But what they're finding in the soil in the East Trenton neighborhood, is the lead levels in the soil at 2,000 parts per million, 4,000 parts per million. And it's all over in the neighborhood. So this is what the East Trenton neighborhood is battling as well as other, I'm sure, low income wow. colors, communities of color. Yeah. And this is how Sherelle and I met um, back in 2022 Shrell had actually reached out to us at Rutgers um, Environmental Occupation Health Science Institute or Rutgers EOHSI um, talking about the lead issues in the soil because back in 2018, the EPA actually came out to East Trenton and did an investigation right. um, to measure soil around the area of what's known as the L.H. Mitchell, um, LH Mitchell um, smelting facility because they were concerned that that facility had contaminated parts of the neighborhood. So when they did that investigation, they, they weren't able to pinpoint where the contamination was coming from, but they believed that most of the neighborhood was contaminated by historic pottery sites because oh. East Trend had tons of had, had tons of pottery manufacturers. But during their investigation of the L.H. Mitchell site, they found that um, over... 68% of the samples that they took, they took 443 soil samples and 300 of those samples were above the 400 ppm lead hazard residential standard from the EPA. Wow. Mm -hmm. Since then, as Sherell mentioned last week, that standard actually um, got reduced to 200 ppm or it, it's not, it's a, the, lead, the lead hazard screening level was reduced to 200 ppm and the EPA has stated that they would recommend a, a level 100 ppm if there's other sources of lead exposure, such as from drinking water or from lead paint. So that's so, so at the time in 2018, the EPA had identified this high, these high levels of lead in the soil, but they also said that there because they couldn't tie it to the LH Mitchell facility, there wasn't anything they could do at the time. Mm -hmm. So in 2022, Sherelle reached out to us because uh, she had been working with somebody who knew us, who we were working in Newark at the time around the drinking water issue with lead. And she, so from there, 
Sherelle and I, we put together a um, community-based participatory research plan to try to identify some of these issues. Um, and with the first question being, are East Trans residents being exposed to lead? Where is their exposure coming from? And how are we going to reduce that exposure? Was there uh, any um, was there any uh, awareness? Was there any physical awareness uh, of lead toxicity that people were were getting sick and going to doctors? And uh, uh, um, was there an awareness? Was there a light bulb going off? Or so we oh. know we oh. know at the state level from state data that Trenton as a whole, the, the city of Trenton has the highest percentage of, of, of children underneath the age of six with an elevated blood lead level. So 6.4% of kids who were screened in uh, the state fiscal year of 2021 had, a elevate, had a blood lead level above five micrograms per deciliter. No. Uh, we don't have any more recent data yet, um, but that's the, that, was the, that was the highest percentage. And this is a, as Sherelle mentioned, it's an environmental justice issue. Um, because the, of the 10 municipalities that had the highest blood lead levels, they're all uh, low socioeconomic status, um, mainly people of color and disadvantaged individuals. Yeah, I mean, but you, with lead toxins, you don't see most of the time a physical ailment. The, the ailment is more neurological uh, or behavioral. So our children, are, they have the effects of chronic low levels. You got the um, acute levels of lead where, you know, oh, your levels are high. You may have seizures. You know, this is something that's detected right away. And the doctors can try to get some way where they can reduce those levels out of your body. But it's those low levels that, that get into our children through their hands, through them touching things as toddlers uh, because of chipping, peeling paint on the ground and it turns into fine dust. And if they put their hands in their mouth, they're ingesting this. So from this behavior or from piker eating things that, that's not food, putting things in their mouth, these behaviors um, can have them ingesting this lead, but the effects of their behaviors may not show right then. They're going to show maybe yeah. five, six years down the line with these children. And what's happening, the chronic low levels can show up in their behavior. They're distracted very easily. Um, they're less able to work independently. They're more disorganized. They're hyperactive. They were impulsive, excitable, and these things, they give these children an IEP, they send them off to another area, and it's not caught when a simple blood test. So where we have to screen, we have to, a simple blood test, if we catch it right away while the child is still young, we can get them away from those surrounding areas because people don't equate um, elevated blood lead or exposure to lead with behavior issues and learning difficulties. Um, and that's a shame. And it exists. And 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 Sean and I uh uh I think maybe we discussed this the first time we met, but you know, these behavioral issues may lead to crime. Of course. The crime in this area, I say Sean's like Sherelle. We 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 cannot make that they we cannot make that correlation. Um, I say, you get rid of the lead, the crime goes down. You get rid of the asthma, uh, less um, people in the emergency rooms. I mean, yeah, there's so many benefits to to eradicating this this exposure. This is so preventable, but we're not spending the money, Calvin. It costs money. It takes money. Yeah. And and we need people to care. These are our children. Correct. It's our future. Our future. It's our future. Um, well, we could talk about this 
uh, endlessly. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, a quick question, because I, I, I wear on the Rector's hat. Um, I'm a Rector's guy. Uh, um, how, how did uh, Rutgers and, and you, Sean, actually get involved in all this? I don't know if we covered that yet. Uh, so we, we briefly mentioned it, but Sherelle actually reached out to us uh, back yeah. in August of 2022. And, mm -hmm. and that's when she showed us all this data from the EPA. And we decided that we wanted to put together a project to try to address the community questions and do community-based research. So... From there, we applied for a um, NIHS um, grant through our EOHSI center, which we received to help pay for some of our some of the work that we're doing. And um, we actually have a, a few we have a few different phases of our project. So we have phase one and phase two, and phase one is really about measuring the neighborhood. So we're doing soil sampling and. The way we were doing our soil sampling was that we actually hired six residents from the neighborhood to collect the soil samples. So we had a community training day at the East Trenton Center, uh, which is right right down there in the neighborhood. And then we paid individuals $25 an hour to collect soil samples with me and Sherelle on various uh, weekdays and weekends. And we've actually collected uh, 249 total soil samples from 125 different homes in the neighborhood. Uh, we're still in the process of finishing the analysis on those, but very, but briefly, um, of the samples that we finished analyzing, so we finished analyzing, um, one second, sorry. We finished analyzing uh, 147 of the samples, which came from 74 different homes. And of those samples, 71 out of the 74 homes that we measured, wow. were, which is 96% of the homes, wow. were above the 200 ppm new wow. EPA lead hazard level. 85% wow. of the homes were above the old 400 ppm level. Wow. Um, and we had our maximum soil level was like 3,700 ppm. We, we were finding very high, mm. le high levels of lead in the soil. Uh, we still have... 50 homes to finish analyzing, which we're, we're hoping to finish soon. But in conjunction with that soil sampling, we also did uh, blood sampling throughout the neighborhood. So at a couple different community events in September, October, and November, all hosted at the East Trend Collaborative, we offered free blood lead testing to any resident who wanted to come and get their blood tested. And those results are still um ongoing and we're hoping to get some more individuals to participate in the blood testing because as Cheryl was saying it's important to know how much lead is in the blood so that way we can especially for kids so that way we can eliminate potential exposure sources from their environment right, right. So that's kind of phase one of blood testing soil testing in phase two we're actually going to go back to these homes we're going to go back to the homes that have high blood lead or high soil lead, and we're going to measure the drinking water. We're going to measure the paint inside the home, and we're going to measure the dust inside the home because we want to identify all the different exposure routes that these individuals may be exposed to. Right. And then we want to get them, as part of that, we want to conduct interventions to reduce those exposures. So depending upon where the potential exposure is coming from, we have a couple different strategies. So if it's from coming from drinking water, we're going to get them a filter that removes lead. We're going to show them how to use it, teach them how to replace the cartridges. If it's coming from soil, we're going to try to use doormats to knock down dust from entering the home. We're going to try to uh, create barriers, physical barriers on the actual soil, such as using plants or wood chips or um, other um, barriers to prevent that dust from coming up and getting into the home. And if it's coming from paint, we are working with a couple different other groups, Green and Healthy Homes and Isles, who have some money to do lead abatements to remove the actual lead paint. So we're hoping that we can get as many homes as possible on those to get those services from those groups. Because um, I know our, I know both mine and Sherelle's goal is to get every home that needs some type of intervention, get them the intervention they need to reduce mm -hmm. their 
lead exposure. And then mm -hmm. the the final piece is we're gonna re we're gonna re go back to those homes to remeasure to see if we've actually reduced the lead exposure. Okay, but that's kind of so, but that's kind of long term, I mean, right? This is a long term thing. Uh, I, I, we may have discussed this even before he went on air. I, I, to me, this is glaring. It's there, and it should be taken care of by a higher authority. And 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 um, not even the state. This is kind of a federal type thing. Uh. uh and I think we briefly discussed it. What 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 is the launching pin to to get you know EPA and and other folks uh, uh, into this? Because to me to me it's glaring. Uh, it, it's a glaring example, and it's tied into uh, environmental justice. This this age old, uh, as Richard Nixon used to say, this age old bugaboo. I'm quoting mm -hmm. Richard Nixon. I don't often quote Richard Nixon. Uh, it's a bugaboo, uh, 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 and and again, segueing to environmental justice. I, 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 it, to me, it's just so uh, obvious and glaring that that uh, you know, super funds and and, and you know, the the, the government's got to step in and, and and really help you, you know, and help what what you're you're doing. Uh, but I, I keep on thinking about, and, and you can answer this. Uh, environmental justice and um i learned about environmental justice we talked about dr nikki sheets and, and i'd gone to three or four lectures and that's one of his, his specialties i'd gone to three or four lectures and at one lecture with a very high uh um in newark uh, i was uh, at the law school in newark I was part of new jersey environmental uh whatever they were called back then and I I was a member and I went to all these things. This is my introduction to environmental justice. So we were at a, a, a lecture uh, and, and they were talking about building a coal firing plant. This is environmental justice, a coal firing plant uh, uh, in Linden, which I think has the highest rates of childhood asthma in America. Mm -hmm. They wanted to put a coal firing plant there and their reasoning was the to bring the coal in from wherever they have the railroad tracks and it's linden so it's a poor city so the in their rationale uh whoever wants to do it is they have the railroad tracks and then they have the ocean right there so they can take whatever waste and dump it into the ocean so it's a perfect place to put in a coal firing plant for people to breathe and children to breathe uh and and then a light bulb went off in my head and and I said, well, uh, guess what? Rumson, one of the wealthiest towns in the country, has the same tracks going through it, and it has the same ocean. So why not put it in Rumson? <laughs> and I actually wrote that up, and it got published in in, in the Sierra Club. But uh, I I was never answered. But to me, that's environmental justice as glaring as glaring could be. So talk a little bit more uh, about. Uh, environmental justice you already touched on it a little bit but you know well you said it before uh, sean you know seven eight nine municipalities here in, in new jersey uh uh have these issues these health issues and then they're not taken care of because yeah um, I, so epa actually has a definition for environmental justice and I, i'll give you the definition and i'm gonna switch it over to sherelle because Shrell actually lives, lives these issues every day. Um, but the definition that the EPA uses for environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And what they mean by fair treatment is that no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, governmental, and com commercial operations or policies. So that's how EPA defines it. And I'll let Sherelle talk more about Trenton. Well, um, I don't want to really, EPA, we, we do have the burdens. We have all of the burdens and not a lot of, lot, not a lot of benefits. But um, 
I just wanted to talk about an environmental justice communities. We also have organizations that come and want to be like saviors to, to help, but um, it's like sympathy. And once we have organizations come in and help or think that they're helping, um, they leave and don't get to really know the community. To have environmental justice, um, the community needs to be involved in the processes that happens in the community, and that doesn't happen enough. So I just have to say that I am so proud of Rutgers, and I'm proud of Dr. Brian Buckley. I'm proud of Sean, because they did not try to say, oh, well, Sherelle, we hear you guys have a problem with your lead service lines. We're going to come in and tell you what to do. No, we're working together. Sean knows the neighborhood. The residents in the neighborhood know Sean. Um, and that's what it takes. It's It takes to tackle this. We need the federal government, Calvin, but we also need community involvement. We need other organizations. We need people like you, Calvin, that can spread the word and get the word out that there are um, cities um, suffering with these issues and our children are taking on this, all this on and don't even know why. I see it. I have little girls telling me, seven-year-olds, oh, Miss Sherelle, the kids don't want to play with me. Why do they don't want to play with you? Oh, they, they don't think I'm smart. Mm -hmm. And this child, the area where she lives, there are abandoned buildings around her. Um, some of the homes in Trenton still have dirt floors. Um and then the soil is bad, but the relationships, all of us. So EPA comes in and they want to also do the testing of the soil, which they are now doing as well. But check this out, Calvin. They asked if Sean and myself could walk with them because it's not easy for people trying to help to come knock on the door and let people know, hey, I'm here to help but they haven't seen you a day before in their life. No. But they trust the community organizer. They trust Sean. Rutgers is there. University, community working together. We can spread that type of connection. Um, we can get a lot more done. Yeah, and I, just to um, talk about what Sherelle was just talking about with the EPA, the EPA has actually reopened their investigation into East Trenton soil. Uh, so they're currently collecting soil samples from around the neighborhood to see if they can tie the soil pollution in the neighborhood that's very high to the the historic pottery industry. And if they are able to tie that to the pottery industry, then it's possible that East Trend um, could be put on the national priority list for wow. super fund. That's great. And, and that would provide potential funding to clean up the soil. But at, the, at this time, EPA is only looking at the soil yeah. exposure. So we're not talking about the potential exposure from drinking water or lead paint or lead dust within the home. It's right. only the uh, soil at this time uh, from the EPA. Well, that's something. Right. But it's EPA something. also, Trenton is an accelerated city. New Jersey yes. is an accelerated state, Biden, Harris, and they're, they're funding um, money to get the lead service lines replaced. So we got EPA taking care of the soil and we also have them taking care of the water. So we need DCA on board and I'm sure they are. And they take care, they usually uh, abate the lead paint in the homes. Okay, that's all positive. Um, before moving on, uh, just take a deep breath. Um, uh, and we're going to go completely off topic for like two seconds, three seconds. Okay. Uh, I always like to ask this because it's it's a warm and fuzzy question. You don't even have to answer it, so be it. But uh, I'm a journalist and I like to ask this because we're friends now. Um, so here's the question. Again, you don't have to answer it and, and you can do whatever you want with it. But here's the question. <laughs> uh, excluding family or friends, somebody you'd like to spend a day with a living or dead excluding family or friends somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with Sherelle Oprah Winfrey 
Oprah. Yes. Great answer. A great answer. Uh, I was five feet away from Oprah a few years ago uh, uh, when she was on, she was a guest in Dr. Oz. They were doing, um, she had done the movie The Immortal uh, Life of Henrietta Lacks. Uh, and she had produced a movie and, and, and long story, I, I was sitting in the first row VIP, literally four feet away from her. And, and I knew I was going to be close to her. So I wore these crazy socks, <laughs> crazy socks. And, and they wouldn't let me wear my Rutgers hat because oh. they wouldn't. Uh, but, uh, I was, I was crossing my legs and I was shaking my legs. And at the intermission, she saw my socks and she went like this. Every intermission, she went like that. So I, I was close to Oprah, but so be it. Sean, you're next. Um, that's a tough question. Uh, I guess off the top of my head, I'd probably just say Martin Luther King Jr. I I think he's uh, the epitome of so social justice and um, so civil rights in this move in this country, and environmental justice is intrinsically tied to civil Correct. rights. Correct. Correct. Uh, great answers. Moving on. Um, just to reiterate that folks should know uh, what are the, the liabilities, the concerns with lead exposure on, on all these, the, you know, the neurological, I mean, everything. Yeah, I mean, even, I just want to say this, Sean, I know I'm not the one to be speaking on this. You the, Well, but I just want to say, um, as children, once it gets in the body, it does not always come out of the body. Um, it can get in the blood. It only stays in there for a couple of days, but lead can travel to your bones, just like it, it's in our pipes and then it leaches out of pipes later. Once it's in your bone, it can stay there for 10 to 20 years and leach out later back into your bloodstream. We have the distracted children, the impulsive behavior, but we also have a lot of adults in my area, in my surrounding area, too many. I can see one, two, but it's just too many. Lead, I do know, um, impacts the heart. I mean, strokes, diabetes, kidneys, um, dementia, lead, toxins, and um, yeah, and it's preventable. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sean. Oh, no, that's okay, Cheryl. Um, so, I mean, when we talk about lead health effects, we mainly focus on kids the most because mm -hmm. it's a neuro it's a neurotoxicant and can cause uh, learning disabilities, uh, slower lower IQ, hyperactivity, all the things that Cheryl had mentioned, along with uh, behavioral issues. Um, but we're also worried about pregnant women too, mm -hmm. because uh, lead can lead to an increased um, chance for premature babies. It can also increase the risk of miscarriage. Um, and also we know that lead can pass the placenta. So if the mother has a high blood lead value, that lead from the, her blood can be entering the developing fetus. Um, and with adults, we're also worried about hypertension and high blood pressure. Uh, it can also, at high levels of, at higher levels of lead exposure, it can also cause uh, decreased kidney function and it can cause reproductive problems. Um, I mean, lead has no use in the body. Mm -hmm. So it, it, in an ideal world, none of us would have lead yeah. in our in lead in our body. Wow. Wow. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's so overwhelming for me to listen to this stuff. And it was overwhelming for me to read these 40 pages. Um, uh, and, and, and kind of learning about that. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, the community has been very responsive and, and, and very cooperative in letting you do what you need to do. Correct. Um, yes, they're, they're um, so because of the work that Rutgers and uh, ETC is doing, we, need the community on board. So we produce jobs for the community. And with these jobs, they're also learning. And we accept anyone from ages 16 and up. So we have a lot of high schoolers, Miss Sherelle, can I get a job? And then before we go out, we, we 
we talk to them about what they're going to do. They get to know certain phrases to use, different terminology while doing the testing. Uh, we go out, they do the testing, we come back, we sit down, we test them on with the knowledge that they learn, and they go tell someone else, and then they come back. And then we have our seniors. So, yeah, this is getting everyone involved. We have our seniors with our lead listening session. And, you know, Sean gets all the results back. We had people do their blood lead testing. Um, and they got the results back. They don't come back to ETC. They go right directly back to the resident. The resident, they come to ECTT, ETC to talk to us and they let us in. They don't have to and they want to know more. We have people say that, Sherelle, how are you going to get residents to give you blood, a venous blood draw? That's not going to happen. I can see if you could do a finger prick. And th these are the naysayers. And on September the 16th, we had we collaborated with Art or Day, collaboration with other organizations. We had an artist that were um, designing T-shirts. We had um, um, information about lead. Um, and we had a room that we turned into a little doctor's office. And people said we wasn't going to get anybody. I think, Sean, we had 23 people that day come and do the elevated, the, the blood lead test. So this is community getting involved. We have EPA coming back and saying that, oh, we knocked on this person door, we knocked on that person door. And we asked them if they knew why we were here, some of the, the children. And it's like, oh yeah, you're here about the lead. So the community knows what's happening now. Where two years ago, they didn't know anything. I would talk to the community. Oh, Sherelle, please, let it been here all the time. It's a part of the earth, yeah, but it's in your, it's it shouldn't be in our bodies. Now the community is on on top. But we have other places in Trenton. You know, you have North, South, East, West. So we're East Trenton Collaborative. We're the East Trenton neighborhood, but we in the North Ward. Our council person is Jennifer Williams. She's beautiful. Oh, we love her. So we have the North Ward, I mean, the South Ward, the East Ward. Well, they're not doing anything over here. When are they coming over here? So we have all the trends are now wanting to be on the same page. And we, because we are the East Trenton Collaborative, we are a community center organizing around the, the local community, but we are also a lead free hub. There are only four right now in the state of New Jersey. Wow. We want to fill out the state with these hubs. And these hubs have a whole bunch of other organizations working together. And Trenton is on top. We have a plan in place. Um, we, I can share this with you. This is the plan. Each hub has their plan or how they want to tackle things um, for this lead issue. So there is a plan in place. You can review that plan and get involved with Lead Free NJ and become a member. I'm writing that down. I'm taking notes. <laughs> well, you're recording. <laughs> I'm recording and I'm taking notes too. Um, so um, when you got lead in your body, sometimes it, it gets out of there naturally and sometimes it hangs around, correct? Mm. Yeah, some of it will be deposited sure. into your bone and some of it will be excreted. Okay. Um, but the but the issue with it being deposited in the bone, especially for pregnant women, is that during high stressful periods of your life, your bones re-release re calcium. And to the body, lead mimics calcium. So during pregnancy, oh. if you have high bone lead, you could actually re-release this lead from your bones Do back again. into your blood, which then can then can affect the developing fetus. Yes. So which is why it's so important to make sure that we that women are getting their proper um, prenatal vitamins and that people are having. Um, the correct diets and getting the right nutrients and vitamins from their diet. Because as Sherelle could tell you as well, is that East Trenton is also a food desert. Food swamp. Food swamp. I, <laughs> I apologize. Food, but it's not great food. Right. 
So I heard the term terminology, the correct one would be more of a swamp because the food that we have is not good for the body. It's salts and sugar, the entire obesity. Um, oh. That's another thing. I, 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 I did a lot of stuff with, with food and food banks and, and homelessness. And, and, and I've done a lot of that kind of journalism. And, and I know that uh, uh, just, I think Mississippi picking on Mississippi as the highest incidence of obesity uh, in America. And part of that is because they're not getting proper nutrition. Exactly. What you just said, they're getting potato chips and Doritos and stuff and they're not getting the proper nutrition. And by the way, that's environmental justice. Right. And that's part of the problem with um, most environmental justice communities. It's, it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, like East Train Collaborative has, has a huge lead, lead issue. But they also have a, they're a food swamp. They have high um, cardiovascular disease. They have high, high rates of asthma. They have high Maybe. high the very low socioeconomic status. Yeah, it's all of these things that come well, together and cause um, cumulative impacts from multiple so sources. Right. Wow. Uh wow. Um, and the people are so beautiful, this community here, Calvin. I mean, they can tell you stories way back when their great-grandfather came in 1800s. There's community here, and we just need people to care and see them. They shouldn't, they deserve life. Correct. We deserve a chance. Correct. You know, keep our loved ones for, we can get we got 10 years. We want to get at least nine out of the 10. Why only get five out of the 10? It's interesting. You were talking about maternal health tomorrow, which is Friday the 26th, so chronologically. Uh, I'm getting up. I don't get up early because uh, I'm a retired guy. I, I like, you know, nine, 10 o'clock in the morning. But tomorrow I'm getting up a quarter to eight and I'm hopping on because tomorrow is maternal health awareness day in new jersey and it was the new jersey is the first state uh uh to enact maternal health awareness day and, and it's a dear friend of mine amy pappy who's this legislative uh pioneer that helped get this passed so tomorrow there's a, a virtual seminar i can send you a link if you're interested i'll, I'll we'll talk about that when we go off air but I, i'm getting up uh, tomorrow at eight in the morning and, and i'm going to be sitting in uh virtually uh on the maternal health awareness just to kind of learn uh slightly off topic but we may discuss this but uh i i learned the the other uh the other day that for the first time ever and this concerns all of us. It's not an environmental justice thing. All of us uh, here on Earth, uh, that they actually found traces of plastic in, in a mother's breast milk. Microplastic. Mm. Microplastic. Uh, and then I saw also the other day that bottled water, uh, uh, just a, a regular has hundreds of thousands of very minute, obviously, traces of plastic that we're drinking. Uh, so it's environmental justice, and it's also justice for all of us to clean things up. Um, you know, uh, we, we could uh, we can go on for a long time. Are there any other uh? We're going to kind of wind down now. Uh, we've gotten, we, we've kind of lifted the, the rocket ship a few feet uh, off the air to uh, raise consciousness. That's, by the way, that's what this is all about. It's raising consciousness and awareness. And, and when I worked for L'Exotica Group, and my boss was the richest Italian in the world, and, and one of the things I learned uh, is you got to keep repeating things because the area between these two ears, very difficult area. When you hear something, uh, it goes in and out, in and out. And yeah. the only way to get it stuck is if you repeat it eight or nine times. And this is a billionaire talking. So I guess he knows what he's talking about. 
So what we're doing here is in, in, in my way, uh, it's part of the process to get things stuck between these two ears. Yes. And that's what we're doing. So uh, any final comments, Sherelle? Um, no, I just want to say thank you. Um, and you're right, because first starting this journey, I remember saying, what the heck is lead? And they're looking at me like, you don't know what lead you never heard. And I kept doing the work and I would get books and I put the books on audio and listen and listen and re-listen. But yeah, but it, it hurts my heart because all we have to do is do the work, care enough, know that this is all our children. Lead is just not, you know, her in black, low income. It's, it's a disparity. It's just hurting them at a worse pace. It's hurting our whole community and our children are our future. And we got to do everything to protect them, even for something like this that's just preventable. Right. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Sharon. Sean? Uh, the only thing I want to emphasize is that um, none of this work or research is possible without the community members. Mm. And that um, moving forward, I, I think it's really important that most of our most of this research is led by the community because like I can't go down to trend I can't knock on doors alone and get people to participate because I don't live in that neighborhood I people don't recognize me but when you have residents who are knocking on doors and you, they recognize that these are their neighbors the message is stronger um it's more powerful people are more willing to listen and also this data that we generate the aggregate data, um, these community groups have the right, they should have the right to this data so that they can use it to yes. advocate for themselves and take it to the government or take it to the regulatory agencies to advocate for cleanups or whatever it is that they need to, for the resources that they need in their communities. Um, so I just want to emphasize the importance of community-based research and the importance that Sherelle is playing in my project, obviously, without Sherelle, there would not be there would not be a project without the community, um, and I give all the credit to Sherelle and the East Trend Collaborative and all the all our various community members who have participated in this process right. so far. Right. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, and thank you both, Sean and Sherelle. Um, thank you for this. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for all of this because. We're all in. We're we're all in this. Um, we are all in this. It, it affects all of us, one way or right. another. Uh, the health of our fellow citizens, and you know, listen, I've been feeling that stuff since, like I said, April twenty second, nineteen seventy, when I realized things aren't good with our environment, and this is just such a part of it. And again, thank you both for being here. Uh, I'm officially inviting you back. Come back any. Anytime uh, I sit in this chair, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, come back. We can discuss more. Uh, we can, it, it's literally endless the things that we can be doing because it's all part of the process to let people know and educate and make them aware. So thank you so much.